Hi, I'm Calivan. We've looked at some examples of good and bad RTS game design in the past, and today I wanted to outline five design principles that are important to factor in to any versus RTS experience. So, dust the crumbs off your shirt, put on some pants, and let's spend the next few minutes talking about a bit of game design. Before we jump into our first principle, it's worth remembering that in any complex gaming system there is an exception to every rule, and the purpose isn't to adhere to everything religiously, but to ensure that any time you do go astray, it's for a good reason. We must always remember our audience, and game design choices must serve both the players and the spectators, as well as being broadly applicable to all levels of experience and ability. Number 1. Less is more if there is one quote I love when talking about design, it's the following. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. This doesn't mean that you need to make a simple game with hardly any units or features. It means that you shouldn't add anything that doesn't directly contribute to your vision or goal, and you should avoid duplication. Nothing comes without a cost, so every time you add something new, it affects more than just the development commitment involved. New features increase the complexity of a game, making it harder for new players to learn and more difficult for spectators to keep up with. Each additional layer also makes your game harder to balance, as it will interact with all of the other components and multiply the complexity significantly. This might be worth it, but a game designer needs to carefully examine the cost-benefit analysis before making any decisions. Perhaps someone wants to add a cool new unit to the game. If this unit serves a specific purpose, opens up interesting new playstyles and fits with the overall objectives and style then it's probably worth it. However, if it is just because someone had an idea for something cool or wanted to replicate a feature from another game then it's probably best left on the cutting room floor. There is a time and a place for unbalanced, complicated or fan service ideas and that's the single player campaign. When we're not worried about careful balance then we can have a bit more leeway on what we include and what we don't. StarCraft 2 does this well, including some cool recognisable units from the previous games in the campaign, but leaving them out of the multiplayer. We didn't need the Medic in Wings of Liberty because we had the Medivac, and we didn't need the Firebat because we had the Hellion. Blizzard could have included them, but they would have had to carefully balance them against all of the other units in the game, making an already difficult job that much harder. Number 2. The Environment Matters when designing factions, units and abilities, one must respect the environment that those entities are used in, and make sure that the features of a particular map have interesting interactions with the other aspects of the game. Making a few careful choke points isn't enough. The terrain and the map's layout of features must be an important part of the game itself. Getting this right is difficult, but the rewards are well worth the trouble. Firstly, it will force players to use different strategies and compositions on a regular basis, keeping the thing interesting, varied and a lot more fun to watch. This is vital to the longevity of a game, as people lose interest quickly when things start to become stale. Secondly, and I think more importantly, it allows you to use your map selection to correct imbalances between your factions, rather than having to keep tweaking individual units themselves. Changing, adding and removing units is always problematic, as it's harder for casual players and viewers to keep up with. Sometimes it's necessary, but it's something that should be done sparingly and with great reserve. If Faction A has a 55% win rate against Faction B and C, then it might be tempting to either nerf A units or buff B and C's units instead. However, nerfing A's units can feel disheartening to someone who favours A, and it can easily result in an overcorrection, perceived or actual, which pushes the win-loss ratio too far in the other direction. Buffing B and C might also be tempting, but this can affect the B vs C matchup in unintended ways. If your environment matters, then a better choice would be to make sure that your next map rotation includes more maps that are better favoured towards B and C's units, and less toward A's. This keeps the chain shuttle so you don't have a greater risk of overcorrection, and also comes with two huge benefits. The first benefit is that none of your units or abilities will actually change, so returning players or casual viewers will still understand the game properly and will still feel comfortable playing or watching. The second benefit is that it's only a short term correction, 
And next season you'll have a new map pool and more opportunities to work on subtle balance changes. There is also a third more niche benefit, in that if you have made a particular map too one-sided, it can easily be excluded by tournament organisers to make gameplay fairer without actually having to modify the base game at all. Number 3. Don't Railroad From the start of the game onwards your players must feel like they are making their own decisions and that there are various options available to them. These choices don't have to be dramatic, but they must exist and have some effect on how the next stage of the game will play out. When we took a quick look at Warcraft 2 the other day, you might have noticed that at the start of the game there are some things a player must do. Starting a new skirmish or multiplayer battle, we were given some resources and a single worker. First we had to start construction of a town hall, and then once that was completed we had to build a farm. There were no other good options available to us at the start of the game, so every single game started exactly the same way. Sure, we could open with the barracks first instead, but we can't build any units because we don't have any food, and if we build a barracks and then a farm, we no longer have enough resources to build a town hall, and we can't gather any because we don't have a town hall to return them to, so we automatically lose. This is boring and repetitive, and probably why when Starcraft was released you already had a space town hall and some workers ready to go. It gave you some options right from the first moment, including some rush builds, some denial strategies, and the possibility of using one of your workers to do some scouting. The differences don't have to be quite this clear cut, but for the benefit of both the player and any spectators, you want people to be able to start affecting the game world right from the beginning and keep on with that same thought process the whole way through a match. If there is one thing that everyone does because all other options are vastly inferior, then it's a good sign that you need some more variety in your game, and perhaps that the different paths you do have available are not really different paths at all. This is also true for tech upgrades. If there is only one that makes sense at any point in the game, then you either need to reduce its effectiveness so that others are more competitive, or add new ones to encourage more variety. Spectators need variety, and players need agency, and if these things are neglected in a game it will get very stale and people will very quickly lose interest. Number 4. Responsiveness Waiting is frustrating, and there is little that is more annoying than issuing an order to a unit only to sit there watching it slowly start to rotate before eventually actually doing the thing that you're trying to tell it to do. This can be acceptable if it is a particular trait unique to that unit, but if it is more common than that then your units are not going to be that enjoyable for anyone to use. Consider the behemoth from Beyond All Reason. This thing moves so slow that it can be outrun by a tree, and takes a long time to respond to new orders. However, this is the single heaviest unit in the entire game. It's only feasible at the very end of each match and is described by its tooltip as a barely mobile turret. This thing is slow by design and its slowness is one of its defining features, so it gets a pass as it's just part of the balancing for this vehicle. If the behemoth was faster to move and respond, you probably couldn't justify its existence. I was reminded by this by how I experienced some aspects of Iron Harvest when it was first released. The heavier mechs were just no fun to use because they were so slow to move and respond. This wasn't just a problem limited to a single super heavy unit, but was a feature of many of the vehicles and it made them frustrating and unenjoyable. Some might argue that it's unrealistic for a massive metal machine to move at anything other than a snail's pace, but if you're going for realism, then you don't set your game in a 1920s diesel punk alternate reality. To give some credit to the developers, I do think they improved aspects of this over the years. However, even when controlling regular units in that game, I still feel like they take a long time to actually do what I tell them to. Responsiveness doesn't have to be just specific to unit reaction and speed, but it can also be a more general concept in which the game world must react to a player's input in the way the user expects. Players need to feel like they have control of the world around them, and it makes the game more engaging and allows more tactical decision making. The amount you allow this can vary, but even a little bit of feedback goes a long way. It doesn't have to be as drastic as Company of Heroes' destructible buildings, even something like chopping trees in Age of Empires or Starcraft's destructible rocks can show a player that the game world is in some way responsive to their input. Number 5. Proper Representation 
Correct representation is something important for both new players and spectators alike, and it can generally be summed up by the following sentence. In an RTS, a unit should look as powerful as it actually is when compared to the other units on the battlefield. When you are learning a new game, or watching a game you are unfamiliar with, it's a lot easier to have fun if you actually understand what's going on. When there is a battle, even a novice should find it quick and easy to evaluate the forces on screen and identify if it will be a reasonably fair engagement or a one-sided slaughter. This is one problem you'll find in Dawn of War 3, where unless you are well versed in exactly what each unit is and how it performs, then you'll have no idea what's about to happen. Most infantry is of a similar size, and most of them have plenty of flashy weapon effects, but the difference between something like a scout squad and a striking scorpion squad is vast. This gets even worse when you start adding elite characters and vehicles into the mix, and it's almost impossible to tell exactly what's going on. Why is that one guy in Terminator armor tougher than those three guys in Terminator armor? You might know, but a new player or a casual viewer probably wouldn't. There are several ways you can do this, and even some subtle changes can go a long way. Size is one simple indicator, and taking StarCraft 2 as an example, you can tell a Zealot is tougher than a Zergling just by their size, just as you can tell that a Thor is bigger than most other units and will easily defeat them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. This isn't the only trick StarCraft 2 uses. Take Ghost as an example. They are small units, but the very presence of an energy bar indicates that they are somewhat special and it's much easier for a spectator to see that these units must have more power than their pure size would indicate. Of course, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's just something that should be generally true if you want people to better understand what's happening. You can use other indicators too, perhaps stronger units are flashier, better animated, or have additional badges or identifiers to mark them as elite in some way. So, We've looked at five important principles in good multiplayer RTS design. These aren't the only important things, and maybe not even the most important things, but they do have a lot of value, and if a developer respects them, then they'll have a much better chance of creating a game that is enjoyable to engage with and also encourages new players to watch and spectate. If you do work at a studio, or you're an independent developer, then I suggest you give these points some thought, as they might allow you to make a better and more successful game. If you're just an average gamer like me, then maybe thinking about these principles will better allow you to create useful feedback if you ever get to participate in any alpha or beta testing. Either way, it's good to have an idea about the kind of things that lead to a better game as it makes it easier to understand why developers make these decisions and also allows us to write better and more accurate reviews to help out our fellow gamers. Hi there, I hope you got something out of this little bit of game theory, and if you've got other ideas about what's important in these games then please share them in a comment. If you enjoyed this video I'd appreciate a like, and if you want more like this then subscribing would probably be a smart plan.